not too long after their impressive presentation at CES, AMD has had their Financial Analyst Day with several interesting announcements that are worth dissecting. On top of that, during an interview with Tom's Hardware, an AMD VP hinted at what RDNA 3 could look like. As it turns out, the rumors and leaks surrounding RDNA 3 could be totally wrong. This video is sponsored by UCDKeys.com. UCDKeys offers Windows 10 and Windows 11 Pro keys at super affordable prices. Currently, they have Windows 11 Pro for $21 and Windows 10, which is what I personally use, for just $14. There's also Office keys of various kinds. I've used this service myself, as have lots of my patrons and viewers, and the service works great, and the keys work globally. We're partnering with UCDKeys for a special special offer. By using the coupon code C30, you will get an additional 20% off of any purchase. Visit eucdkeys.com or click the links in the description. Starting with graphics, AMD's David Wang took to the stage in the recent AMD Financial Analyst Day and added some info to what Lisa Su had already disclosed earlier in the year. The first slide, which we had already seen at CES, can now be analyzed within the overall context of AMD's strategy. Starting at the top, AMD keeps repeating that they are using an enhanced version of TSMC's 5 nanometer process. What does that mean? That Back in January this year, Lisa Su said this in a round table with press. Our 5 nanometer technology is highly optimized for high performance computing. It's not necessarily the same as some other 5 nanometer technologies out there. And at the end of last year, TSMC announced their N4 node, which is an enhanced version of N5. It's possible that RDNA 3 is on this N4 node, but what seems most likely is that AMD is using using TSMC's 5NP, which is also an enhanced version of 5N that delivers higher performance. So why does the slide say 5 nanometer process specifically? Well, the first and second bullet points in this slide are by their very nature contradictory. If the packaging is chiplet based, then there will surely be more than one process node. The interposer or IO die will be on a node, the graphics cores on another node, and the memory probably on a different node as well, if there are even separate memory chiplets. More on that later. So I'm looking at 5 nanometer in this slide point as an umbrella term for what nodes will be used in RDNA 3, particularly for the core logic. And that's an important detail because there can be a huge difference in performance going from regular 5N to 5NP. For instance, the Apple M1 is on 5N, while the recently announced M2 is on 5NP and the latter's GPU saw an increase of 10% in clock speeds, even while adding more cores. I think AMD is intentionally keeping things vague as far as the actual node is concerned, so as not to give away too much in terms of performance. In fact, the uplift in performance per watt is marked as greater than 50%, not just 50%. It should be noted that AMD's overall 5 nanometer share is expected to reach 20,000 wafers in the last quarter of this year year, increasing to 40,000 wafers in Q1 next year. In fact, AMD is set to become TSMC's largest 5 nanometer client in 2023, beating Qualcomm, MediaTek, and Nvidia in the process. The thing is, these 5 nanometer orders will be divided into CPU and GPU. Considering the company is only investing around 5 billion in wafer allocation for the next three years, and when Nvidia invests more than that in just one quarter, and and only does GPUs, I think AMD will struggle to gain significant market share. But we will go over the overall GPU strategy later in the video. The second bullet point comes as some relief as I've been talking about RDNA 3 being chiplet based for over a year now, with several pundits, particularly on Twitter, insisting that RDNA 3 would be monolithic throughout the stack. So it seems I was correct on this one, not that I was the only one making this prediction, but I was 
will likely be taking a big fat fail also, as we'll see in a second. As far as the packaging is concerned, I did a few videos already on the possible chiplet configurations, but in a recent interview with Tom's Hardware, AMD's corporate VP Sam Nafziger had some interesting, if vague, things to add. He stated that there would indeed be separate chiplets, not memory chips, though he didn't nail down exactly how AMD will do the split. I'm quoting directly from Tom's interview here. Nafziga also stated that one can reasonably infer from the way Ryzen chiplets work what RDNA 3 will look like. What does he mean by that? This could be interpreted in different ways, but it seems he's hinting that we will see an IO die along with multiple compute chiplets, and he added that this would be done in a graphics-specific way. Well, graphics is very different from CPUs. You have a lot more bandwidth, for one, and there are a lot more things that can move to the I.O. die, like the memory controllers, the video encoding and decoding, the display outputs, and anything else that would be common to the core GPU chiplets. I actually talked about this in a video back in March of 2021. The GPU chiplets would then have a ton of compute units and cache, and the Infinity Fabric controller, and probably nothing else. It could be something like six GPU chiplets on top of the interconnect, which would be the proverbial I.O. die. Or the I.O. die is in the center like in CPU land with the core chiplets around it. If that's the case, and that seems like a plausible interpretation given what this AMD VP said, then the packages I've been suggesting in previous videos would be wrong. I base those predictions off of existing patents, and as such they are plausible, but as we all know, not all patents materialize. So based on what Sam Nafziger said, and therefore inferring that Navi 31 would have six graphics chiplets, the question becomes would they actually fit into a regular GPU package? If so, how small would they have to be? Before we look at that possible configuration, let's look at the one I've been talking about. This is the same design I showed in past videos, but now using the same style as the MI250X. In fact, it's basically that server GPU divided in half. In this possible configuration for RDNA 3, you'd have two graphics core dies, each with 6,114 stream processors for a total of 1,200, 288 stream processors. Then four memory modules for last level cache, or infinity cache as AMD calls it, and underneath it all, an interposer with the memory controllers, codecs, display output, etc. So seven dies in total. If you recall, I made this based on patterns that I studied over the last few several months and some other information that came out through leakers and such. But now with official information from AMD and this interview on Tom's hardware, I think we can look at other possible configurations that actually seem more likely. Firstly, Nafziger clearly stated that there won't be any memory chips, so that throws this version out. Also, I'm not sold on the idea of it having 3D stacking with the interposer underneath the chiplets. It's not impossible, but it seems unlikely. In the financial analyst day, the slide for cDNA3 states that it will be built on a 5 nanometer node with 3D chiplet packaging, while for rDNA3, it says 5 nanometer node and advanced chiplet packaging. This could just be AMD holding their cards close to their chest and not revealing if 3D stacking is involved in rDNA3, but why would they specify cDNA3 as having 3D chiplet packaging while RDNA3 as advanced chiplet packaging, omitting the 3D there. I think it's more likely that RDNA3 will be a 2.5D package instead. So that's another reason why this possible configuration is likely wrong. Secondly, something like the 5800X3D runs really hot because of that stacked memory. So I think stacked chips on a first generation chipless GPU is probably not gonna happen. I mean, obviously I'd love for that to be 3D stack memory, maybe on top of the I.O. die. Memory transistors aren't scaling anymore, so they would only be robbing the graphics dies of logic. But like I said, for a first generation of graphics chiplets, I think it would be a bit too ambitious to have 3D stacking. Based on what Nafziger said, we can infer that each GPU chiplet would have 2048 stream processors, which is exactly what we find in Navi 23. We can infer then that Navi 33 would have two chiplets with 2048 SPs each, or a total of 4,000 
1096, Navi 32 would be 4 chiplets with 2048 SPs each, or a total of 8192 SPs. And Navi 31, the big boy, would have 6 chiplets with 12288 stream processors total. This lines up with Twitter leaker Radfire's leak from a while back. TSMC reported that for a typical SOC, their 5 nanometer technology, their 5 nanometer technology scaling was projected to reduce chip size by 35% to 40%. So if we take Navi 23 as our baseline for the RDNA 3 chiplet, which maxes at 237 mm squared and reduce it by 35%, so that 65% of the size, we get 154 mm squared. Again, assuming we're interpreting Navsiga's comments correctly. So we have Navi 21, like the 6900 XT, at 520 mm squared. By the way, does anyone remember who first revealed the die size of Navi 21 back in 2020 and got it spot on? It was me, so go subscribe to my channel. Anyway, we got Navi 21 at 520 mm squared, the Navi 23 like the 6600 XT at 237 mm squared, and the RDNA 3 chiplet would be 154 mm squared, so roughly this size in comparison. So for 6 RDNA 3 chiplets to fit into a package like the 6900 XT, it would have to look something like this. The 6 chiplets just about fit, so the IO die would have to be an interposer under it all. As we've already discussed, that seems highly unlikely. But remember, TSMC said that their 5 nanometer process could bring a reduction of 35% to 40%, and I'm using 35% scaling here. Furthermore, the graphics chiplet could be even smaller, because remember, a lot of the repeatable stuff is being offloaded to the IO die, whereas Navi 23 had all of that stuff taking up space. So your encoding and decoding, memory controllers, etc., which means this chip chiplets would likely be significantly smaller, to the point where you could fit a separate I.O. chiplet, not as an interposer, but rather as its own 2.5D chiplet, like so. So you have the I.O. die in the middle, and this would have all the stuff that's common to all the chiplets, and perhaps even some last level cache of its own. This would mean the RDNA 3 graphics die would be around 100mm squared. How likely is this designed to be the final package configuration? Configuration compared to the ones we looked at in my earlier videos, I think this version would make a lot more sense from an economical standpoint, because the core RDNA 3 chiplet would be the same in all GPUs. The only thing that would change would be possibly the I.O. die, which is on an older, cheaper node. Some among you watching might remember a very early package that I proposed over a year ago that looked similar to this. Here, instead of six small chiplets, we have two large chiplets with the IO die or active bridge in the middle. Active simply means it would have logic of its own rather than just being a bunch of passive connections to link the two graphics chiplets. So there are several ways to skin a cat and several interpretations possible of the patterns that I've analyzed, of the rumors that have come out, and even of the AMD official information. Here are some of the ones I've covered. Like I said earlier, one of the first videos I made on the RDNA 3 chiplets back in May of 2021 had this design with the active IO bridge in the middle. And that's certainly a possibility, but it would imply different masks for Navi 32 and Navi 33, rather than having a common graphic style for all of them. This is important to note and I'll come back to it. Then more recently I went over the possibility of RDNA 3 having 7 dies, and it came to a configuration like this, where there would be 2 large graphic dies in the center, 4 memory chiplets around them, and the IO interposer underneath it all. As I've already discussed, this now seems unlikely, given what AMD disclosed in their financial analyst day, and based on what Nafsiga said in that recent interview. And lastly, there are the 6 chiplets on top of an interposer, and the more feasible 6 100mm square chiplets with an IO die in the center of the package. To me, these seem the most likely. The 6 small chiplets version fits with what 
AMD has said, and matches the recent rumors suggesting there will be seven chiplets in total, but presents a difficult technical challenge for a number of reasons that I've covered in previous videos. If you remember, in a past video, I talked about a rendering technique that divides the image into tiles and where each chiplet could handle a separate tile asynchronously. Check out my past videos on RDNA 3 to understand how AMD has solved the chiplet's challenge for graphics. This old configuration of mine seems the most viable from a technical standpoint, but doesn't match what was said at this recent interview and it doesn't feature seven chiplets. It does match something that came out a while back that I had forgotten about until Paul from Not An Apple Fan reminded me of, which was that LinkedIn profile that popped up which states that Navi 31 is on 5 nanometer and 6 nanometer, Navi 32 is on 5 nanometer and 6 nanometer as well, while Navi 33 is only on 6 nanometer. This would give credence to there being different designs for N31, 32 and 33, meaning there would not be a common small chiplet for all of them. Confused? Well, I think we need to think about this in the context of AMD as having a diverse portfolio that covers a lot of segments. As you can see in this chart, if AMD decides to use a common chiplet for all Navi GPUs, like that six chiplets configuration suggests, then that's a total $542 million design cost. You can see here on the right how that's divided into several stages. If they have to create a separate design for Navi 32 also at five nanometer, and then Navi 33 at 6 nanometer, as that LinkedIn profile leak suggests, this design cost would have to exist for those chips as well, in addition to the cost of Navi 31. So that would be a total design cost of over $1.3 billion. And that's not including the IO die. Do you think a company that has to juggle a very meager cash position of just over $3 billion to pay for design costs of Zen 4, server CPUs and GPUs, and RDNA 3, and on top of that reserve wafer capacity would be spending 1.3 billion in design costs for a consumer segment that represents a tiny portion of their revenue. Economically speaking, this six chiplet design plus IO die would cost less than half of the two large die configurations. <laughs> Looking at the overall AMD context, I think I'm putting my money on this common small chiplet design, despite all the rumors and leaks that contradict it. The next item discussed by David Wang was the re-architected compute unit. If you remember back with Turing, Nvidia went from having an FP32 pipeline per CUDA core to dividing the CUDA core into an FP32 pipeline and an INT32 pipeline. And then in Ampere, the same INT32 pipeline became an FP32 pipeline as well, which doubled their CUDA core counts in a roundabout way. So this re-architected compute unit for RDNA 3 is probably going to be doing the same thing, doubling the FP32 pipeline per CU. That could yield something like 20 to 30% better performance for certain workloads on top of everything else, which is what happened with Ampere. In that same interview with Tom's Hardware, AMD's Sam Nafziger confirmed that there will be no fixed function matrix multiply core in the RDNA 3 micro architecture. Both Intel and Nvidia have dedicated cores for such tasks and both have alleged advantages in having them, such as the LSS using tensor cores to run faster. Seeing as AMD was able to create FSR2 without the need for specialized hardware, it seems that using the silicon for things that matter more for rasterization makes sense. Also, if the compute unit gets re-architectured to having two FP32 pipelines, I think there will be enough compute for pretty much anything you'd need to do on a consumer card. So I can see why AMD says there's no need for matrix multiply fixed function. Before we move on to the next point, Navsiga later did have some details to add as far as performance per watt is concerned. Performance is king, stated Navsiga, but even if our designs are more power efficient, that doesn't mean you don't push power levels up if the competition is doing the same thing. It's just that they, Nvidia, will have to push them a lot higher than we will. Remember that RDNA 1 was clocking at around 1.9 gig 
gigahertz, while RDNA 2 we've seen go upwards of 2.5 gigahertz and 2.8 gigahertz in the case of the 6500 XT that I reviewed a few months back, so I don't think it's unreasonable to expect RDNA 3 to clock upwards of 3 gigahertz, <laughs> but to do so I suspect it will be drawing a ton of power. The 50% better efficiency applies to the lower tier cards, like the RX 7600, that will probably have 50% better efficiency, or higher even, when you compare it to say a 6700 XT, but when you move up the stack, something like a 7900 XT will likely have maybe 15% better efficiency compared to a 6900 XT, because of the diminishing returns in efficiency as you increase clock speed and cores. So while Nafziger might claim that they can push power up to catch up to Nvidia if they need to, the reality is that at the top end of the power curve, you might increase power by 30% and only get a 2% performance improvement. We saw that with the 6950 XT for instance. So while it seems likely that the 7900 XT will consume way less energy than the RTX 4090, I don't think it will be too far off while having similar performance levels. It's not like AMD can push RDNA 3 to 600 watts and get a massive jump in performance, that's not how this works. For example, going from 450 watts to 600 watts might net them less than a 5% performance increase. So moving on to this optimized graphics pipeline, David Wang had this to say regarding ray tracing in particular. To bring more photorealistic effects into the domain of real-time gaming, we're developing hybrid approaches that take the performance of the rasterization combined with the visual fidelity of ray tracing to deliver the best real-time immersive experiences without compromising performance. This sounds like word spaghetti marketing speak, but what I think he was saying here is that AMD will use a combination of techniques to get real-time ray tracing to work without a performance penalty. What these hybrid approaches are, I'm not sure, but it makes me wonder if AMD will have its own ray tracing API in addition to supporting DXR. I don't think that that's what David meant, but who knows. And lastly, regarding this next-gen Infinity Cache, we've already established that there won't be separate memory chiplets, based on what Nafziger said. And because memory transistors aren't scaling, I'm not sure what AMD can mean by next-gen here. My guess is that the IO die also has last-level cache, and that it is all coherent between it and all the chiplets, as I've already discussed in previous videos. Beyond this presentation from David Wang and the interview with Tom's Hardware, there were a few things in the four-hour-long Investor Analyst Day that caught my eye. Notice, for instance, that the upcoming Rockham 5, which is AMD software suite for AI, will now support RDNA GPUs. So far, if you wanted to do AI with AMD hardware, you were limited to something like the MI200, which costs over $10,000. I suspect no one is using MI200s for anything whatsoever. I think AMD server cards are only used in supercomputers and government contracts, and maybe a few HPC applications with finely tuned software specifically designed for AMD hardware. The AI hardware business is almost exclusively NVIDIA's, so having comparatively cheap RDNA cards now be usable for AI is a good step forward, but I'm doubtful that the Xilinx acquisition will help much there as far as training is concerned. AMD is hiring software engineers aggressively, so hopefully that will change in the coming years. But anyway, I don't think the fact that RDNA GPUs can now be used with Rock'em 5 for training will have much of an impact as far as availability for gamers, not for another four years at least. Another thing that might have flown under the radar is that AMD plans to have a refresh of RDNA 3, aptly called RDNA 3 Plus, as this slide suggests. It's possible this is for laptops only, which would mean that Strixpoint, which is the mobile variant of Zen 5, would be on 3 nanometer, along with RDNA 3 also updated to 3 nanometer. So on the desktop, we could 
possibly see an RDNA 3 refresh earlier in the year and then RDNA 4 launch later that year, also on 3 nanometer. And finally, going back to that point I made earlier regarding AMD's overall graphics strategy, AMD stressed that they will be focusing on premium segments. They'll have a nominal top to bottom stack of GPUs, but the focus will be on selling the most expensive ones. Focus means wafer allocation. So if the chiplet strategy ends up being made up of different size chiplets, then the majority of money invested will go towards the high end. Focus also means margins. So like with the 6000 series, the 7000 series will be all about margins. So you can expect some predatory segmentation like we see with Nvidia, where some GPUs only exist to entice you to buy the tier above. Meaning there will be lots of 7900 XTs and 7800 XTs on the market, but barely any 7800s and so on. And to be honest, even though this sucks for us the consumer, particularly at the low end, the reality is that this is the right strategy for AMD. Because even if sales numbers go down and the outlook for the PC segment isn't looking great for the coming years, if the company's focus is on higher margin products, then their profits can continue growing. And with that, they'll have more money to play with to compete with Nvidia for wafer allocation, for instance. The last thing to look at is pricing. TSMC is raising prices further thanks to a recent increase in energy costs due to Thai Power, the island's energy provider, raising prices by 15%. TSMC had already warned that in Q1 next year, prices will be going up by 5%. So in total, we might be looking at a 20% price hike being passed down to their customers, including AMD. With that in mind, I think the 7900 XT will be priced at $12.99. Even though Nvidia is trying to reduce the wafer supply agreement they have with TSMC given the poor demand in PC, I don't think Nvidia will be lowering prices either. So the 7900 XT equivalent will probably be selling for $2000. So you're saving $700 on the GPU and maybe another $100 on the power supply if you go with AMD instead of Nvidia. The more you buy, the more you save. So with all that said, it seems we're getting a clearer picture of what RDNA 3 will look like. It will likely feature a common chiplet, it will have massively better performance per watt compared to Nvidia, and AMD will be focusing primarily on the premium variants, namely the 7900 XT and 7800 XT, which will probably be sold north of $1000. And according to Digitimes, it should be launching in late September. Let me know in the comments what you think of all this. This video was made possible by my awesome patrons. Consider joining my Patreon for just $1 per month and get exclusive access to the Cortex Discord server, where myself and a welcoming community of enthusiasts discuss the semiconductor industry every day. Thanks for watching and until the next one.